He kōna e pūrangi tēnei nā te reo irirangi o Aotearoa. When people awoke on the 16th of August to hear reports that Tom Hall had been arrested, the initial reaction seemed to have been just complete disbelief. Welcome to Crimes NZ. I'm Jesse Mulligan, and in this episode, we're going further back than we ever have before, back to 1886, in one of the most sensational crimes of the 19th century, the bustling town of Timaru. And much of New Zealand was stunned when society darling Thomas Hall was arrested for the attempted murder of his wife, Kitty. But that was just the beginning. Author Peter Graham joins us to outline those shocking events of 1886. He was called the vilest criminal in New Zealand history. Another phrase that was uh, used about him is that he had been convicted of the most inhuman and detestable crimes one has ever read or heard about. That gave me a real interest in finding out just um, what it was and why it was uh, why it stood out in in um, uh, in this in this way. And I managed to find a printed copy of the of the evidence of this trial of two trials actually, and every word of evidence ha- has been uh, recorded and was available. And I started to read it, and I realised that this uh, had to be turned into a book. And and I was also, I suppose, moved by the fact that it was the the sheer amount of detail about life that was going on in this um, little place, Timaru, in the 1880s. Um, it it was a it, it was a remarkable window into into this time and place, this little town which, uh, as one observer put it, had become a hotbed of snobbery and social competition, which um, <laughs> we, would, we would not really expect from a place that 30 years later it, it, had, it had been no more than a wool shed and a couple of shacks on a beach. And it had come uh, all, this, all this way in, in, in 30 years. Let's begin at the beginning then, Peter. Who yeah. was Thomas Hall, or Tom Hall as he went by? Well, I call him Tom Hall, um, uh, as if he was a friend of mine. But everyone else seemed to call him uh, Tom Hall. But yes, it is. It 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 was called um, by Sir Francis Adams, one of our um, most uh, knowledgeable criminal lawyers in New Zealand, the greatest criminal cause celeb in New Zealand history. So, who is Tom Hall? Well, uh, Tom Hall was. Um, a well-known figure in Timaru. He was a nephew of Sir John Hall, who had been colonial secretary of New Zealand, and he had, and only a few years before, had been the premier, which was the prime minister that was so described at that time. Uh, his uncle had been the prime minister. His father, uh, another Tom Hall, was a very prominent figure in um, Timaru civic life. Tom was, to all appearances, a uh, successful businessman. He was handsome and charming, a good dancer, had a fine voice that was much in demand at um, musical soirees, which were um, (laughs) a a popular entertainment uh, at the time. Uh, He rode beautifully, and he and his wife, Kitty, were leading lights of the of the South Canterbury Harriers, the local hunt club, and he was regarded as extremely charming uh, to women, and was in great demand until not long before he was arrested. He had married Kitty Kane, who was the stepdaughter of Captain. Henry Kane, who was one of the uh, real founding figures of Timaru. And mm. when people first heard of there were a population about 3,000 3, at that time, Timaru, just to give that feel, it was a small town. And when people awoke on the 16th of August to hear reports that Tom Hall had been arrested uh, with an accomplice called Meg Houston for the attempted murder uh, of Kitty 
by poisoning, uh, the initial reaction seemed to have been just complete disbelief. Yeah, and, and if we look at a, a motive, where the motive begins, it's probably useful to ask what line of work Tom was in. Um, yes, absolutely. Tom had set himself up um, in business, um, and he was generally described as a land broker and commission agent. He, he established a firm called Hall and Meeson um, in 1882. They operated as land brokers, commission agents. They arranged insurance for people and um, land sales. And if you had any funds for investment, uh, Tom was your man. He was intelligent, it seems, reasonably intelligent. Uh, he attended Christ's College, where he for a few years where he won prizes for history and mathematics. And uh, no doubt he thought that with his charm and natural ability and family connections, uh, he could not fail to do well in business, but it uh, didn't really work out that way. By 1883, South Canterbury uh, was sinking into deep depression. Uh, for example, his father who had several uh, runs in the, in the Mackenzie country, was forced to sell and to uh, sell the large and uh, imposing house that he had uh, built in, in Timaru, so he had run out of money. And Tom, uh, in 1883, as everything seemed to be going downhill, uh, that was the time when he started to inject himself with uh, regular heavy doses of morphia, huh. uh, morphine in, in modern terminology. Um, uh, he suffered from asthma and severe sciatica, so it's possible that he might have thought that he was, um, this was a way of treating those things. Anyway, getting to 1884, Hall and Mason's ac accounts were in a, in a complete mess. Tom had been stealing money from clients and he had committed uh, numerous forgeries. And the typical forgery was um, a promissory note. And the first one was a, a promissory note for £800 in the name of Edward Cameron, repayable in six months. So this note is forged. No money was lent to Edmund Cameron. And Tom then takes the forged note to the bank, who discount it. They pay immediate cash to Hall of, say, six hundred and fifty pounds on the on the eight on the eight hundred, and that would have to be repaid in in six months. So, anyway, by eighteen eighty four, the total of Hall's um, defalcations ran to about six thousand. Pounds, and unless he could raise a large sum of money, uh, he would be exposed as a forger and a thief, and a long prison sentence would be necessary. So Tom had to come up with a plan, which he did. Mm. He was regarded as pretty good at what he did, right? No one, no one suspected him. I think he was. I don't think anybody... Uh, he kept up a front. He managed to roll money around, as people do, so he always seemed to have some, uh, have some money. But I don't think anybody, uh, except possibly the manager of the Bank of New South Wales, had any idea that, um, that uh, Tom Hall was, was in financial trouble. His plan was uh, diabolical, really. He decided he would marry Kitty Kane have a child by her, and then kill her. Um, Kitty was a woman who was 24 or 25. Uh, at that time, she may have felt that she was a little bit on the shelf. Uh, she was described as nice-looking rather than beautiful, on the plump side, easygoing, pleasant, giggly, and uh, a bit naive, not to be too unkind uh, about it. She didn't worry much about her clothes or appearance, and uh, Tom decided that he would um, honour her with uh, with marriage. And as I've said, he, she was one of uh, well, she was one of two stepdaughters of Captain Henry Kane, a man who had, after being the first storekeeper it, to arrive in in. Uh, 
Tamaru had gone on to to really make himself a fortune, and and most of that money had gone into uh, two trust funds, of which Kitty was going to be a major uh, beneficiary. Uh huh. Uh, and so that, Tom that, Tom might have had his eye on that trust fund. Tom, eh? Tom Tom definitely knew about it and was exceedingly interested. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about that in a moment. This trust owned a lot of land that was ripe for redevelopment for housing on the uh, expanding fringes of of Timaru. But he needed cash in a he needed cash in a hurry. And he decided he could deal with that by insuring her life for, as it happened, six thousand pounds. Two policies totaling six thousand pounds, just to be sure of everything before he uh, got married. He went and got some legal advice from uh, a solicitor in Christchurch, uh, not using one of the local lawyers, probably not wanting it to be known what he was doing. Anyway, he he went to see a man called Thomas Joint, and three things emerged in answer to some hypothetical questions involving people who were not named. One, Captain Kane would have to die before Kitty, or she would not inherit uh, anything that he still had in, in his own name and was part of his estate. Two, if Kitty were to die without having a child, her interest in the trusts would pass to her sister Alice. Three, if Kitty were to die having had a child, her interest would automatically go to the child, and Tom, as the surviving parent, would control and in reality have the use of Kitty's share until the child came of age. So he'd actually have his hands on the trust money uh, for 21 years, which would suit him very nicely. So that was the plan, and uh, it, 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 it was uh, a dreadful plan. And um, in pursuance of that plan, Tom and Kitty were married on the 26th of May, 1885. Captain Kane didn't much like what was going on, and he made a point of being away uh, in Dunedin at the time of the wedding. They later um, sort of uh, made it up. He didn't, he didn't like the excessive interest Tom was taking in, in Kitty's trusts. And in fact, those trusts were being... Uh, much mismanaged. But anyway, before the marriage, three weeks before, Tom bought from a local chemist 120 grains of tartar emetic. Um, now, this is a poison. It was a poison that could be could be purchased. It's a, it's a poison that, in crystal form, uh, incorporates um, the me the metallic element antimony, mm -hmm. and it was in crystals, and it was um, it was soluble uh, with water, and three or four grains were enough to kill an adult. It was quite a hard poison to administer in some ways, but. Uh, because if you had too much, you would vomit it up, and uh -huh. if you put it with food, you could vomit it up and so on. But that was the poison Tom decided to use, and uh, uh, just again, just before the marriage, he borrowed from a bookshop um, a book called Hedlund's Action of Medicines to study the subject of antimony, and uh, a few weeks later he bought a large volume called Taylor on Poisons, which he used to read uh, constantly, actually. He was very yeah. fascinated. No, um, no, alarm, no alarm bells in Timaru at this stage? Well, not, not, not absolutely. 120 grains of tartar in and two books on poisoning people? Not at all, not at all, not at all. And he told, he told the chemist that he wanted to use the tartar emetic to make, uh, mix with tobacco and make himself some cigarettes that were going to be used for... Uh, relieving his asthma. That must have been something that was done at the time because the chemist didn't seem to think it was um, at all un odd and actually made some suggestions about how he could um, make them more uh, effectively. The starter emetic did have some uh, medical uses, but none of them really, uh, if we reject the idea that he was going to 
used them to make his cigarettes. Uh, it's quite clear they were bought as part of his plan to murder, to murder Kitty. By mid-October 1885, Kitty was um, expecting a child. And then, as we have seen, Captain Kane had to die. Uh, from the end of November, uh, Tom became a regular visitor to Captain Kane. He used to go and see him every morning and every afternoon. Uh, but sudden Captain, interest in the health of his father-in-law, hey? A, a great interest in the health of his father-in-law. The father-in-law had all sorts of health problems, heart disease, congestion of the kidneys, senile gangrene, and he, he was pretty much bedridden at that time. And he lay in bed, he drank, he was prescribed by his doctor two quarts of champagne a day and uh, some additional champagne was often required at night apparently and that was in, in, in addition to whatever whiskey or rum or brandy he would also drink. So he just seemed to lie in bed all day drinking really in point of fact. Now at that time a nurse whose name was Miss Margaret Graham Houston a very nice ladylike Scottish girl, as she was described, was engaged to look after the captain. She is the person who was later um, arrested with Tom as Tom's accomplice. From the time Tom was in regular contact with the captain, uh, he had mysterious vomiting fits all the time. And it seems that it must have been because, because of poison that was being given to him um, at, at, at that time. Every time he had his drink no longer agreed with him. I don't think it stopped him drinking, but he, if ever he had a glass of whiskey or something, he found it made him vomit. And uh, quite clearly the suspicion is that Tom was putting something... Um, well, didn't Kane actually say that he thought Tom was tinkering with his whiskey? He didn't seem to pursue that as a serious suggestion because, you know, he continued to be on friendly terms with Tom. So he, oh, so he, he was a funny... He, he thought the whiskey was, was problematic, but he didn't quite connect it He to didn't the guy quite connect it with yeah. Tom, I think. That's, that, that, okay. that's, that's how you could put and it. And so back to Kitty, his new wife. He's also sitting with her, yes, and, yes. and he's poisoning her at the same time too. Uh, well, I think he... No, 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 no. He was waiting uh, for the child to be born. And uh -huh. the son, the son yeah. whose name was Nigel was born on the 19th of June, uh, 1886. So that was a few months after Captain Kane died. Captain Kane died uh, in January, 1886. And then the child is born, and at that time an elderly nurse uh, called Mrs Ellison, who features in the drama to, uh, to come, was engaged to look after both Kitty and the new baby, and the, the, the nurse, Margaret Graham Houston, stayed on as Kitty's lady help, she was called. I don't know if you know what that is. A lady help is um, uh, someone who's uh, an employee, but not sort of so more at the social level of the um, employer, perhaps, is one way of putting it. Mm -hmm. um, a superior kind of servant, I suppose. I think there was often quite a bit of friction between people like um, the lady help and the... Uh, right. And, and the, and, and or, the or Yeah, there might have been uh, friction in particular in this household because it sounded like Tom and Margaret might have had something going on as well. And that is the way it looked to many. But only uh, days after the, after the baby's birth, the birth of little... Nigel, Kitty began to experience vomiting attacks. Actually, another thing, I think a day before the child was born, Tom went back to the chemist and bought another 120 grains of tartar emetic. And it is clear that at that time, Tom uh, was, um, was poisoning Kitty. So she had these vomiting attacks that went on for weeks. Now we get really to the heart of the drama. She had day and night of vomiting. She got worse and worse. She was wasting away. She was thin as a rake. Uh, she had a dull complexion. Her, she twitched convulsively. Uh, her lips and nostrils were sore. 
She had sores all over. She had blue lines around her gums and blue rings and complained of stomach pains and a tightness around her neck as though someone was strangling her and unquenchable thirst. And this went on night and day. It went on for nearly two months. Her main doctor was a man called Dr Pat McIntyre, who was a great mate of um, Tom Hall's. And But various other doc- doctors were called in, Timaru doctors, another three Timaru doctors. A doctor was brought up from Dunedin, and Tom was saying, you've got to do everything, you've got to find out what's going on. I'll do anything if you... I don't mind what I pay, I just want to make sure that um, Kitty recovers. And he would sit by her bed for hours on end, stroking her hand and looking into her eyes and uh, in a, you know, a loving sort of way. And I think that's one of the things that people who've looked at this case think is just so, so disgusting that he was able to do, inflict this terrible torture on his wife and sit there um, pretending to be sympathetic. Anyway, this went on this went on for um, nearly two months. The doctor didn't seem to have a clue what was going on and but eventually after about two months somebody took a, a, a sample of vomit and urine from Kitty and they had that tested and they found traces of antimony. And, of course, it was staring them in the face that this was a case of poisoning. Uh, it really could not have been anything else, I don't think. And But then they had a, a, had a good idea it was antimony, was the poison. And um, then we get to not long before um, the arrest... Kitty was under strict orders only to take food from the uh, or nourishment wasn't really beyond taking food from Nurse Allison, and then uh, one day, uh, the day before the arrest, uh, Nurse Allison gave her um, some water that had a nasty taste, and uh, Kitty didn't like it, and Nurse Allison took a, took a little sample and set it aside, then. Tom and Meg, well, that was Margaret Houston, came into the room and they said, oh, this water doesn't taste good. And, and then Meg says, oh, well, if it doesn't taste nice, you can't, you know, you won't have it. And then she took the cup outside and threw it out into the garden and threw away a piece of gauze that had um, been on top of it and probably would have had traces of the poison. And later that afternoon, that sample, the little teaspoonful of liquid that Nurse Allison had kept, was taken to the local chemist shop and given a, a, a sort of a, a, a field testing and again found to be antimony. And by this stage, um, Pat McIntyre, the doctor, finally woke up and went down to the police and swore an information that resulted in the arrest of Tom and... Uh, when they went to arrest him, there was a great struggle and Tom was trying to throw a little bottle he had in his pocket into the fire and uh, Meg Houston sort of came to the rescue and uh, tried to sort of defend him. And Anyway, it was found that he was carrying around in his pockets this um, substance and uh, Tom was put under arrest and... Uh, Meg Houston was acting in such a very strange way that, it, to my mind, it's uh, entirely understandable that um, that she was uh, she was arrested as well. Tell me a bit about the trial when it happened. There was a trial in Christchurch, and Tom was convicted of attempted murder in eight minutes, and Meg was acquitted, and. Um, uh, there was a, a rider verdict that she left the court without a stain on her character, and uh, and I think what scuttled the Crown's case was um, medical evidence that had been taken. She'd been examined by a doctor who found that uh, she had all the evidences of virginity were present, and that was enough really to demolish the prosecution case. I, and I, I argue that um, while I don't think there was enough evidence against her really to result in a conviction, um, I certainly don't think she left without a stain on her character and I think there was very considerable suspicion. 
there was a second trial when they dug up the corpse of Captain Kane. The um, father-in-law from the a few months the, earlier. The father-in-law from a few months earlier. And they found antimony um, in his system. Tom was put on trial this time for murder. And uh, he was convicted of murder, but the judge referred a point of law to the Court of Appeal and the Court of Appeal, at that trial, evidence had been admitted of the case involving Kitty, and that was enough to overturn the conviction. So at the end, Tom didn't hang. Tom walked a free man. Uh, he took himself off to Australia, and, uh, and he lived, after serving 21 years in Mount Eden Prison for the attempted poisoning case. He and only... Kitty, Kitty refused to believe he'd do it. In yeah. fact, although she eventually divorced him, actually left him some money in her she, will. She paid him an allowance in her will. And actually, he was also paid a small allowance by Sir John Hall on condition that he stayed out of New Zealand. Um, I, I, and, of course, that's the first known case of a... There were plenty of people paid remittances to live in New Zealand, but I, he's the first one I've heard of somebody who paid not to live in New Zealand. You've been listening to Crimes NZ, hosted by me, Jesse Mulligan, and this is the last episode of the podcast. Thanks so much for listening. If this is the first episode you've come across, go back and have a listen to our earlier eps, from mysterious disappearances to robberies gone wrong. We've covered most of New Zealand's most well-known crimes. All the episodes are available on the RNZ website, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and iHeartRadio, basically anywhere you find your podcasts. And I'm not going anywhere. You can still catch me each weekday on the afternoon show here on RNZ National. Listener.